The Victorian era, a time of change, innovation, and probably the most strange social values. Victorian society, especially the elite, had all sorts of weird fetishes and unbelievable fancies. The Victorian elites were, in simple terms, wannabe royalty, and made up all sorts of social rules and became obsessed with subjects you would never expect, mostly because they had nothing better to do with their time. So sit back, subscribe, and prepare yourself for this one because things are going to get freaky. Egyptology. You probably weren't expecting that to be on this list, but during the early 1900s, the science of archaeology, though in its infancy, was centered around Egypt, and Victorians were obsessed with all the fascinating artifacts brought back from dug up Egyptian tombs. And for Victorians, it wasn't enough to do something normal like put them in a museum. Victorian paint makers used to ground up mummies as one of the ingredients in brown paint, and aptly named it Mummy Brown. Even though some thought turning mummies into paint was unethical, others claimed it made for poor quality paint. But mummy paint wasn't the only weird use for mummies. Victorians would put mummies on display in places like candy stores, because there's nothing quite like a mummy watching you as you pick out your bonbons and lollipops. In 2007, a forensic scientist tested the contents of a jar found in 1867 in a Victorian-era Paris pharmacy. The label identified the contents as the remains of Joanne of Arc, which is far-fetched, but the test results actually found something even more absurd. It was made of mummy dating back to sometime between the 3rd and 7th century BC. So what was a jar of mummy doing in a Victorian pharmacy? Well, Victorians had their scientific fancies too. And that brings us to corpse medicine. Although not original to the Victorian era, people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body was a miracle cure for whatever ailed them. For hundreds of years, corpse medicine had been a popular prescribed medicine, especially the skull believed to treat apoplexy. Corpse medicine was at its height in the 16th and 17th centuries and persisted well into the Victorian era. Medical texts specify which morsels are good for which ailments, and there are recipe books that explain how to prepare the pieces too. At the time, executioners were often linked to corpse medicine, and it wasn't uncommon for them to do double duty as a bringer of death and healer of the poor, selling pints of warm blood from very recent clients. There are even records of candles being made with human fat during the Victorian era up to the 1880s. Now you might be thinking, how much did it cost? Was there some sort of black market where you could buy the corpses of people and make them into medicine and candles? No, but there was a thing called grave robbing, by which many Victorians made a lot of money. The medical world in Victorian times was advancing by leaps and bounds. But these advances needed one thing above all else, corpses. And the fresher, the better. Known as body snatchers, grave robbers would wait until families would leave the cemetery and get to work before the rot sets in. Doctors and medical students paid good money for the freshest of corpses to advance their anatomical knowledge. Which is good. It's good. The next thing poor Victorians would have wanted was to be snatched up alive in the middle of the night for some Frankenstein experiment. Now, you might probably be going to a grave of a loved one thinking their body is still there, but, well, sorry, there is not. But Victorians probably wouldn't mind anyways, because they had a strange technique of preserving the memories of their deceased loved ones. Families would pose for photographs with their newly departed loved ones. The bodies would be kept at home for the mourning period and photographs were staged with not just the deceased, but their parents or siblings, sometimes posing as if everyone were still alive. Children sat with their dead parents, parents held their dead children. Some photos even show faces with open eyes that were painted right on the photo and so on. It was a whole lot creepy, but considering the rate of death in the Victorian era, it was a chance at a last memory. At the time, diseases practically stalked Victorians. Measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, cholera, 
It was a sort of gauntlet of death that children and adults alike ran through every day. Those were real threat, and sense of loss led to people keeping memento mori, Latin for remember you must die, trinkets like locks of hair and photos of the dead. Note, photographs were fairly new technology at that point, and they only started to become affordable in the mid-1800s. As such, it was often only when something tragic happened that people would think to immortalize their loved ones in photographs. Now, moving on from the cadavers of human beings to the cadavers of animals. Yes, Victorians also had a fascination with animals, but I probably should correct myself. Live animals. In the Victorian era, there were countless clubs dedicated to eating the weirdest animals alive. Even Charles Darwin, the man behind the theory of evolution, was a keen eater of anything exotic. Some clubs specialized, such as the Ethiophagus Club, dined on the strangest sea creatures they could find. Others, like the Gluten Club, of which Darwin was a member, seemed not to care what they were eating as long as it was a new experience. We can say for sure that people in the Victorian era just had too much time and money on their hands. It's truly challenging to even wrap your head around something as bizarre as these habits and hobbies let alone imagine how they were socially acceptable. But speaking of wrapping your heads, Victorian women had quite the fashion sense back then, wearing gorgeous plumes of feathers on their hats, and sometimes even whole birds. Taxidermy wasn't just for Walter Potter and his fans, as women all over Europe and USA wore hats with brilliantly horrendous taxidermied birds balanced upon their brows. The demand was so excessive that a conservationist estimated as many as 67 species of birds were threatened with extinction due to this trend. Along with whole birds on their heads, corsets, as we all know, were a popular commodity in the Victorian period. With almost all women wearing them in some form. But things did start to get a little silly over the period. Generally, corsets were used to reduce women's waists using laces to pull tight the waist and hold in any unwanted yet natural fat. Some, though, did take the practice to an extreme by using smaller and tighter corsets, bringing in the waist further and further. The most extreme measures were to 14 inches. You can imagine the discomfort and what potential damage this would cause to the internal organs. But still, for Victorians, fashion is fashion. And for the rest of the Victorian beauty routine, it would include things like a puff of ammonia, a pinch of arsenic, and a dollop of lead. Standards of beauty might change from generation to generation, but Victorian beauty routines came straight out of a chemistry textbook, particularly the section of stuff labeled hazardous. White skin was everything back then, and women achieved that by washing their face with ammonia, then covering it with a lead-based paint. And in order to keep that fresh-faced look, they would rub opium on their face before bed. Some would even take a dose of arsenic to eat. And if you are one of those unlucky ones to have thin eyebrows and eyelashes, a nightly smear of mercury could help with that too. Arsenic was used at the time for a whole host of cosmetic products. It was also found in wallpapers, dresses, toys, and even medicines. This was generally due to the fact that arsenic was very cheap at the time due to the Industrial Revolution. It is one of the common elements in the Earth's crust, so the increased amount of mining that was taking place meant it was becoming more easily available. But it's not like the Victorians didn't know it was poison. As a matter of fact, it was one of the most common poisons used for murder at the time. Luckily though, in 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed which regulated the sale of arsenic and products containing it. It wasn't an outright ban on such products, but it did help minimize the risk. But contradictory to the fascination and desires to make themselves look the best they can, Victorians also had their issues with hygiene. Bathing was something that wasn't as popular as eating live animals at the time. Many doctors did advise bathing for one's health, but people just wanted to believe the old wives' tale that bathing was bad for you. Many of the Victorian era's hygiene problems centered on water use. Indoor toilets existed, but no indoor plumbing. Folks would defecate inside, but the feces just made its way to literal cesspits 
which would have to be removed and would later be sold to farmers. The upper class, who had access to their own bathtubs, still had the trouble of heating up gallons of water for them and only bathed a few times a month. As for the lower class, they bathed maybe once a year. And when it came to washing clothes, urine was a common cleaning agent. Down the line, for extremely obvious reasons, the Victorians came up with sanitary science, which is the study of public health, dirt, and disease. Note, flushing toilets appeared almost 4,500 years ago in regions such as the Indus Valley and Mesopotamia, where there were systems which used pipes to carry waste from inside of a building to the outside. So it would probably be more correct to say Victorians finally came to their senses and became obsessed with sewers, sanitation, and cleansiness, which led them to not only create the famous sewage systems in London, but also to create the first public restrooms with flushing toilets. But all that was just a little glimpse into the bizarre trends people followed in the Victorian era. And just by that glimpse, all I can say is, thank goodness, that era is over. If you found today's video interesting, comment down in the section below and let us know what topic you would like us to cover next. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and like.